Explorers, my name is Sanaa Olavache Shabazz and I am with the Merced State Explorers, a group showing girls the world's endless possibilities. Today we have an exclusive interview with Miss Harriet Elam Thomas, a former U.S. Ambassador and author of Diversifying Diplomacy. We have some questions on her travels, her experience as an ambassador, and her advice for us traveling girls. Let's get started. So my name is Kyra Hudson. I'm an alumni explorer. I'm currently a junior at the University of Michigan, but I'm very excited to be back for this opportunity to facilitate this exclusive interview with you, Mrs. Ambassador. We're so honored to have you here today, and we're excited that you share our love and admiration for Merce Tate. Um, so we'd love it if you could start by just telling us a little bit more about you know yourself and growing up and how you got to where you are today. Well, first I say a special thank you to all of you for being willing to have me spend some time with you and help me reminisce about where I was when I was your age. And heavens, I didn't have such an institution or a group to help prepare me for a life that I had no idea I would experience. I grew up in Boston in a place called Roxbury, which was considered, would be considered today the at-risk area of the city of Boston. And I'm the youngest of five children. I had siblings who were 18, 19, and 20 years my senior. And so my parents were surprised that they had a child at that age, and they were the age of my grandparents. All of them have passed away, so I'm the final member of the Elam clan still around. But as a result of their influence on my life, I was able to spend some time overseas as an exchange student. and that truly changed my life. Um, so the explorers have prepared some wonderful questions to ask you a little bit more about your experience and to learn from what you've done and be inspired. Um, so we'll start with a question from Dari. Hi, I'm Dariana Browning. Greetings. And um, I just wanted to know, what inspired you to write your book, Diversity, Diplomacy, um, My Journey from Roxbury to Dakar? My students, my husband, dear friends who've known me for many years, said that you have a story to tell. And sometimes we think the challenges that we face throughout life are just the normal, everyday experience. But they're not necessarily normal for people who did not look like me. And I finally realized that after the young men and women with whom I interacted for almost eight years at the University of Central Florida, said to me, the things we've learned in your class will remain with us for our entire lives. And their constant prodding is what resulted in my deciding to write the memoir. Thank you. Um, my name is Maria Daniels. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. And my question is, as an African-American female ambassador, what were some of the struggles you faced? I can honestly say it was sometimes more difficult being a female than being African American in the Foreign Service. But initially, my goal was to be a secretary because women were not encouraged to do things like study math and science, never mind law or diplomacy. And therefore, I thought I wanted to be a secretary, work in my brother's offices. They were lawyers in Boston, and I enjoyed preparing the summons for people to come to court because they were in blue paper and they looked terribly official and impressive. And I wanted very much to be terribly official and impressive. So I thought, I think I should be a legal secretary. I had no idea the world was out there that was going to welcome me in a way that I had not been welcomed in my hometown in Boston. So I went on and went to college only after I received scholarships to go to college. I was overweight for most of my adolescence and so I studied all the time. I didn't have time to go to the parties. Nobody was going to ask me so I spent most of my time in the books. And I didn't feel I had, had a sense of self until I graduated from high school and I received scholarships to go to college. So that's sort of the early part. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Leah Pettis, 
And my question for you is, when you were younger, did you want to be an ambassador? I had no idea what the word meant. I had never met an ambassador until I was probably 19 years old. I wanted to interact with others after I stopped being terribly shy, and I was for a long time in my youth because I was always the little Elam girl in Roxbury, Massachusetts. It's not easy to grow up with three older brothers and a sister, all of whom were accomplished in the community. Everybody knew their names. And they would always say, I was, the people would say, there goes the little Elam girl. And one day I got enough nerve to say, I have a first name and it's Harriet. And I was named after Harriet Tubman, so I feel very proud of that fact. But as a young person, I truly did not have any idea of what diploma diplomacy was all about, what diplomats did. And I lived with this family in France, and I met, I think that was the first time I met an ambassador while I was in France. And I was then 18 years old. I found them very engaging and knowledgeable about the world. That fascinated. Uh, what was your first, first ever job? I love that question because it was a job that one would never have imagined I would be sitting here talking to you about being an ambassador. When I was about 15, I collected nickels in the coin sh slot for those who wanted to go swimming at a pool in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. What is so much fun about this experience? I was scared to death of water, and I was not going in a pool, and to, to, to this very day, I don't know how to swim. But I learned how to interact with people as they came through the turnstile to put their money in, in the slot so that they could go to swim. And none of the people coming to swim looked like me. This was at a pool in Cambridge, Massachusetts, probably in the late 60s, no, excuse me, the late 50s, in fact, probably 58, 1957 or 58. So that was my first job. What led you to pursue the role of being an ambassador? When I became a career diplomat, I was fascinated at the, the, the fact that you had the responsibility of representing the President of the United States whenever you were posted abroad. Now, I began as a secretary in the Foreign Service, because in those days, the question they asked any woman was, do you know how to type? So as I watched other people writing political and economic reports about the country where I was posted at the time, France, I said, it seems to me my parents made the sacrifice to send me to college, and I really should not still be typing reports for other people when, in fact, I was able to think, analyze. And when I read the reports, they didn't seem any more substantive than something I could write. So that's when I thought it was important to return to the United States and to become a career diplomat. Has living abroad ever changed your political view? No, because I learned how to respect the main core values of the United States. Uh, I can honestly say that we had to remain apolitical, neutral, as career diplomats. So I served six different US presidents, both Republican and Democrat. And in fact, I was appointed by President Clinton, and President Bush confirmed that I should remain for the, re the last year and a half of my term as the US ambassador to Senegal. I often had the question, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I was truly independent. Now my political, or I should say my social views, changed significantly. Because I watched how people interacted abroad. I learned more about the value of socialized medicine. People could be cared for and not have high insurance costs. This is from the time I'm 21 years old. That was important for me to know. 
and that had a significant impact. <coughs> Um, what is something that you would tell a kid trying to figure out what they want to be in life? To observe those around you who are doing things that are a little unusual. We all know what a doctor does. We know what our professors do. We know what a dentist does. But how many of us knew what diplomats do? We know what computer technology experts do now. We know what a banker does. But again, when you say the term international relations, there's a little question in your mind. I'm sure it was in mine. If you say political science, then you have an idea that that person wants to study how to be an effective politician. But what is diplomacy all about? So I would suggest that anyone who is curious about career paths make it his or her business to meet people who are doing something a little unusual. What were your habits as a child? I snacked a lot on <laughs> what would be considered junk food now. I read an awful lot. And I think that was perhaps another reason why I became even more curious about the world beyond the confines of the United States. Television came into being when I was very young. But we only had one or two channels. And the biggest show was the, for me was the Ed Sullivan show to watch even the Michael Jackson when they were the <laughs> Jackson Five. Uh, and once in a while, they had someone from overseas who was an artist. But I can honestly say reading was my joy, because I could fantasize about where I might fit in this culture that was far away from home. I had a question about whether or not, like when you were abroad, have you found it difficult to describe like American culture or your experience in America being a black woman and how um, that's shaped your perspective and your experience? Um, has that been difficult to describe to people because it is so complex and, and so diverse in America? It wasn't really difficult, it was a joy because I represented something that was not the majority population. And therefore, I could hopefully change many of the stereotypical views that many people had about the United States abroad. My mother wasn't a drug addict. My father was not an alcoholic. I grew up in a two-parent family. Oh, how unusual was that? And I had a genuine interest in learning about new things, new people, and new cultures. I also must say that my brothers and sisters had a significant impact on me. I was, again, the youngest. I went to plays with my brothers. But I went kicking and screaming to museums to see exhibits with my sister-in-law. And never knowing 20 years later, I would be the American cultural attache at the embassy in Athens, Greece, and thrilled at having the Dance Theater of Harlem and the Alvin Ailey Dance Company come to Athens for me to be their host before they performed at the Athens Music and Dance Festival. What a thrill to have that opportunity. But I had no idea this would happen. And I wanted to be a dancer, but I wasn't quite as elegant and tall as the lovely dancers from those two well-known American institutions. So I was able to change the perception of the United States just by my being there and not doing things that they expected us to do. Where, Did I, uh, okay. okay, where are some places that you've traveled? I've been to Egypt. I've seen the wonderful Sphinx. All of the beautiful things that I saw, they were much smaller than what we would perceive them to be. They really aren't as huge as they appear. The pyramids are not as huge as you would think from looking the, at them on pictures, in pictures. I, I must say the Colossal, Colossus of Rhodes was pretty large, and that's very close to Turkey. Um, I went to Ephesus in southern Turkey, which is anyone who is a student of the Bible knows that it is where it's the path of St. Paul and to see the library. All of these ancient history structures are still standing. 
And you can imagine it being a library just by the way the columns still exist. That's, that was mind-boggling for me. Of course, the Eiffel Tower still is the iconic view of anyone who says they want to be a world traveler. The French are far more open to Americans than they were when I was there as a young student. Um, but the perhaps the answer to your question is very difficult. Each one of these places had a charm. The Leaning Tower of Pisa, Pisa, Pisa really leans, and it hasn't fallen over yet. <laughs> uh, the, the Roman Colosseum is impressive, and what struck me is that I said, somebody who must have been a slave had to build those incredible stadiums. They may not have been brown skin, but they certainly were enslaved to have made that incredible structure. How long have you been an ambassador? I was ambassador for three years, and you, I've been in the diplomatic service 42 years, longer than your parents are old. <laughs> And I often say that um, if I had it to do over again, I would take the same career path because it really was mind-expanding, satisfying, and educational, not only for me, but all the people who, with whom I interacted who didn't expect a woman of color to speak Greek, Turkish, and French. And do so in a way to give a speech in each of those languages about African-American sciences, scientists and artists to Fulbright programs in Turkey and in Greece. They will not forget that speech, neither will I, but it certainly had a dual purpose of educating, telling people about America in their own language. When you travel, how do you prepare emotionally and physically? You immediately read as much as you can about that culture and the norms that how they govern families, how family structures work, because they're often very different than those in the United States. Emotionally, it takes a little more effort because you're going to leave your parents or you're going to leave your siblings and you cannot, when I first went to Paris, pick up the phone or touch something called a computer and do FaceTime or Skype with them. <laughs> because to talk to my mother and father from Paris, I booked a phone call two days in advance. This is in 1965, so that I could talk to my parents on Easter weekend. I can also say emotionally, I had to prepare my family members even more so than myself because they were going to be away from their baby sister. Could she handle being in a foreign environment all by herself? That was challenging for them, and I, I wanted to put their, increase their comfort level, while at the same time increasing mine. <laughs> and I, I must say that I found people to be very warm, welcoming, less judgmental about the color of my skin, than I could ever imagine, and I must say, in many ways I was welcomed in homes and in settings abroad more than I was in Boston, Massachusetts when I was growing up. Where's a place where you haven't been but that you'd still like to visit? I've not been to New Zealand and I've not been to China. Um, I think I would like, I've been to Australia, so perhaps I'll focus more on China, but as in gregarious as I may be, I'm not comfortable with large crowds of people. I would not go to inauguration parades despite being invited, and huge football, or because I was afraid people would have mass hysteria because I've seen people killed in stadiums abroad. So I'm not sure that I would be comfortable in China because there are so many people. But I'd like to go to Kathmandu, fewer people fascinating sounding place <laughs> and I've never been there. I've been to 55 countries and I don't mean in the airport to transit. I mean to be in that country for at least three to five days if not longer. That's a lot of countries but I haven't been to those <laughs> places. 
Could you tell us how you found out about MERS Kate in the Travel Explorer program? Well, I was doing an article on why, what US foreign policy might be with the land called Wakanda from the famous film, Black Panther. <laughs> and as I read an article about the perception of Africa, MERS Tate came to the fore. Because in the 1920s, she was at the, really at the forefront of sensitizing African American scholars about the role of Africa in world history. And of course, went to Howard University. But now I understand why there is such a club here, because this is her origin. Mm -hmm. But to be very honest with you, it's thanks to the film, The Black Panther, that I learned so much about Morris Tate. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated and thrilled, because as a diplomat, I don't know why I didn't know about her before. <laughs> and to learn about your existence just rang my chime. Great question. Thank you. Yes. When you were in different countries and you were speaking those languages, what were some of their reactions? Shock, disbelief, not quizzical, just plain shock. But a sense of comfort came over them. Nelson Mandela has often said that if you speak to a man in a language he knows, you speak to his head. But if you speak to a person, a man or a woman, in a language their language, you speak to their heart. And therefore, I learned that if you could communicate directly to someone in his or her native tongue, you diminished so many barriers immediately, almost immediately. You see a comfort level come over people when you speak with them, because then they know that you're genuinely interested in them. And you don't have to give a speech, you can just give the amenities. Hello, how are you? Merhaba, nasılsınız, in Turkish. Yasus, tikanis, in Greek. Bonjour, comment ça va, in French. And I can't speak Spanish, and I live in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. I can understand much of what Spanish-speaking people say. But language learning is key, because you, again, you reach your interlocutors in a way that you could never reach the person only speaking in his or her language. I'll give you a quick example. Did any of you see President Macron speak to a joint session of Congress in his visit this week? Did he speak in French? No. He spoke in English. My respect for every head of state in this country would be heightened even more if we could handle as he did, a speech in English, in another language, be it Spanish or French. Hopefully that day will come sometime soon. <laughs> what is one of the most memorable, memorable things that you've done as a diplomat? I think meeting Nelson Mandela. And then I was a student of Turkish struggling to pass a Turkish exam, which was becoming even more challenging. And on June 20th, Nelson Mandela spoke to a joint session of the United States Congress. He knew more about American history than I knew. He showed no sign of anger or disdain for his captors. And he kept us in rapt attention. I was seated next to Judge Alien Higginbotham and his wonderful wife, who should have been on the Supreme Court. And when I finished listening to this incredible speech, a gentleman who was a maverick senator or congressman from Wisconsin said to me, I've just seen the man. Would you like to meet him? And I will say very quickly, I was very judgmental of this congressman because I'd seen him in Athens before. And he walked around the Acropolis without a shirt on his back. And I thought it was disrespectful. But I forgot all about that. And I said, <laughs> I'd love to. This very same man walked me into the room to meet Nelson Mandela and Win Mandela. Now, you've heard me talk this afternoon. I was speechless. I didn't know what to say other than 
I am honored to be in your presence. And when I spoke to my minister in Washington about that, he said, that's all you needed to say. After that, I had 10 days to prepare for my Turkish exam. You had to read a paragraph translated. You had to interact with a conversation. And then you had to do a phone conversation. I passed the Turkish exam because I was determined that if Nelson Mandela could have survived 26 and a half years in prison, I could pass that exam at age 47 years. I was 42 when I learned Greek and 47 when I learned Turkish. So never say you're too old to learn a new language. What does it take to be an ambassador? In terms of career ambassadors, and that's what I was, you are not even eligible to be considered for the ambassadorship until you've been a career diplomat 25 years. So you go through the ranks of the Foreign Service to be a political officer, a public diplomacy officer, a labor officer, an economic officer. Then you become deputy, you become heads of embassy sections. Then you become deputy chief of mission. And then you might be nominated to become an ambassador. You will need to have had at least two very senior management assignments. And that comes after 25 years. That means as deputy chief of mission, you run the entire embassy, the budget and fiscal office, the political, the economic, labor, public diplomacy office, the central intelligence agency. Every agency of the US government almost has an embassy representative. So you need to know about interacting with other human beings, coming from different cultures, coming from different disciplines, before you are even eligible for the nomination. It then goes to the White House. You are then required to sit before a Senate confirmation hearing. You are asked questions for about 45 minutes about the country where you are being nominated to serve. You need to know the recent history and the past history what US relations with that country are all about, what are the key challenges, and what are the easy ways in which you can develop rapport with that country. That said, you still have to wait for the Senate to confirm you. You've only gone through the four senators who are asking you questions, and it goes back to the full Senate. And then you are confirmed. Quick response on political appointees. If you have $500,000 and you've given it to a campaign, you don't have to wait 27 or 37 years as I did. You might become an ambassador at age 35. The youngest we've had is someone who's 37. But that's usually a political appointee who then really relies on that deputy chief of mission to run the embassy. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ambassador, for sharing all these great insights for us. Um, we are nearing the end of our show. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to you and Thomas for your time. This experience will help us grow, and we could take this on our further travels. And thank you guys for watching, and we'll hope to see you soon. Thank you.